Good evening. Our Pittsburgh chapter AGO members are fortunate to be able to attend concerts and recitals in many beautiful churches. Today, two of our chapter members will take us on tours behind the scenes of two notable instruments, showing us chambers, unique passageways, and vistas only accessible to the selected friends of the organists. Don Fellows will show us the Beckerach organ in Oakland's St. Paul Cathedral, and J.R. Daniels will show us the Skinner organ in Sacred Heart Church in Shadyside. Hope that you enjoy this unique tour of Forbidden Places. Well, welcome. Welcome to St. Paul Cathedral in Pittsburgh for this rather informal uh, organ tour of the interior of the Beckrod organ. But since we are on our way up there, and it'll take us a while, I'll tell you a little bit about the building. St. Paul Cathedral was completed and dedicated in 1906, and it is the third cathedral of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. The first two we're downtown Pittsburgh, and after a big land sale, we were chosen to have this location as the new cathedral. So in 1906, this was completed, as I mentioned. Uh, the architects were Egan and Prindeville, a Chicago firm that specialized mostly in ecclesiastical uh, design. And we'll have a, just a, a quick look around here. Most all of the statuary in the cathedral is created by Joseph Sibbel, S-I-B-B-E-L. He was a German-born fellow who emigrated to, to New York City. Um, and practically all of the statuary, including the bronze and the uh, Stations of the Cross, which you see, are all of his work. Um, there are approximately 100 and five stained glass windows throughout the cathedral. And those were provided by uh, three different firms. One was Willett of Pittsburgh, uh, later moving to Philadelphia. Um, these windows particularly are his work. And in the apse of the sanctuary is uh, the English glassmaker, John Hardman, and then there is also some glass throughout the building by uh, the German firm uh, Meyer of Munich. <clears throat> As you look to the back to see the organ, uh, this is built in 1962 by Rudolf von Beckerath of Hamburg, Germany. Uh, and you'll see if, if we get close enough here, you'll be able to see uh, the basic layout of the instrument. And uh, of course the divisions mounted on the railing that are close to us is the repositive and uh, that is the lowermost manual. And then there are three stories to this organ, three levels. The top uh, dead center is the great division, uh, which uh, the central six pipes that we see there are from the 16 foot principle. Uh, of the grate. And just below that on the lower level be beneath it is the soil division. Um, and in its facade would be the eight foot viol flute under which you see shamad reeds, the trumpet on shamad both at eight foot and four foot pitches. Uh, and below that you can't see in this photo or in this uh, video, but below that is the burst work or the solo division. And of course on either side, right and left are the pedal. Uh, pipes and these are the pipes that we see are part of the 32 foot uh, principle. So uh, we will go up the stairs and see what's going on up there. So the magic gate leads to the staircase, which you know, there's always a question. No matter how many times we count the steps, we come up with a different number, a different result. I think there are 46, but I could be wrong. When we get to the top of the stairs, 
we will find uh, we'll find an enormous painting that hangs on the wall here and it's a crucifixion painting and it was created for the previous cathedral uh, by the Italian artist Pietro Gagliardi and this large work which is very difficult to to see any detail in it because it's it's old it's been damaged and it's been in this spot since 1911 so about a hundred years or so um, of grime and wind and moisture that has accumulated on it but it it is a crucifixion depiction and where it was hanging in the previous cathedral was over the high altar and for a brief couple of years here this hung above the high altar uh, in this cathedral i think that uh, it was placed here because it was the only place where we had a wall that was large enough to accommodate it so above me at the top of the stairs before you go into the choir loft is this giant apparatus uh, these wrought iron platforms and ladders were all added when the cathedral was renovated in, uh, for its centennial in 2006 in order for uh, the workers to be able to do the work that was necessary in this building they had to comply with OSHA regulations and so these platforms and ladders that have cages and wraps around them were installed in various places in the cathedral I believe there are three more of these above us before we ever get to the bell tower or to the bells. And the bells, there are only three of them here, and they were cast by the McNeely, uh, sorry, the McNeely firm of uh, Troy, New York. And you can see the areas where the, where the ropes would have come down. Now those are, the bells are operated on a mechanical system that's installed by Verdon, and so it's a controlled thing that you no longer need to pull uh, on the ropes. Okay, so here we are at the choir loft door. Let's go in and see what's happening in here today. So, here's the side of the Beckerot, and into the large gallery which right now is seeming very spacious because we're in COVID times and without choir we've removed uh, some of the choir risers so, so it seems rather spacious to me uh, so if you could picture over the high altar way in the apse that gigantic painting of the crucifixion that we just saw um, it was for just a few years hanging there um, but then removed. I believe once they installed the glass in the apse, it made it possible for them to then relocate the uh, artwork. So, since we're largely going to look at the interior of the organ, uh, let's just open up the console and then we'll go over to the blower room and see what's happening in there. So, I've removed the music rack so that we could see and inspect the mechanical action that uh, is present in this organ. Um, let's go first to the blower room, which is in the east tower, which is at the corner of Craig Street and Fifth Avenue. And Beginning with some of the items in here, I can tell you that this organ, although built in 1963, received a fairly substantial rest renovation, restoration, rehab, whatever the right word is. It's not really restored because some components were changed, but uh, the work was done. It was pretty substantial by the Taylor and Booty Company, and they, of course, had subbed out some of the work, uh, particularly the electrical components, which was significant. Uh, to Dick Houghton and, and his team of workers. Um, so right here we are looking at uh, the one of two blowers. They're twin blowers, one uh, supplying 
wind to this reservoir and then a second reservoir that's behind which you can barely see because of the shadows uh, but trust me there's actually two of these sets one supplies wind to the C natural side of the organ and the other provides wind to the C sharp side so um, if it's the C sharp side, every note that uh, C sharp, D sharp, F, G, A, B, and then back to C sharp, uh, all those are supplied by one blower. Uh, and here we have above a couple of remnants of things that were in the organ originally. Uh, I will show you when we get inside the organ uh, what um, has been done. But essentially, uh, here's an example right here of uh, one of the stop knobs. Um, and this design was rather faulty somewhat early on and it could well have been you know the the pollution in the building and the dirt and dust uh, but it would not be unlike uh, unusual to to draw the stop by pulling it out such as that and stop knob screws onto this here so you pull the knob and nothing would happen and most of that was due to the fact that these connections were not being made so it would not be unusual to have to jiggle the knob to, to make the stop actually work or you'd have to get in here and clean and file or spray with contact uh, fluid something that would make the circuit complete thus making the stop pull when the stop then is complete it would go uh, send a signal to the pneumatic uh, stop slider motors which here is an example of a bank of these I think these probably would have been uh, from the positive one of the sides of the positive division so that when you pull the stop uh, a small amount of air would come into these chambers force the slider then into the on position and it just so happens that these are all bolted together because they uh, in the positive division that's just how they sit um, and you'll see the the replacement examples when we go inside the organ now to its right is the example of uh, a setter board that was placed on the back of the organ this is not original uh, it, it originally there was a, a swiss designed uh, system here that was intended to provide multiple levels of memory uh, it, apparently it did not quite work out so well so um, within a couple of years then uh, the Beckert firm added this setter board and you know for those of you that have never seen one of these uh, there's a piston that had a letter A uh, on the console and then uh, whatever tab you put in the down position then would be added to that piston when you pressed it. So it was sort of an ingenious way to get some mileage out of the pistons that were there, uh, but also it meant that you would be running back and forth from the back of the organ to the console to uh, you know set things or make changes throughout the, the course of a liturgy or concert. And so uh, Beckerot in his very next organ after this one found several new systems that he thought would be more reliable than the ones that you're looking at right here. So Beckerot in his next organ had a, a new, found a new type of stop motor, uh, stop knob that he felt was more reliable, started using them. He also replaced these pneumatic devices uh, with another machine, much like what we're going to see inside. And of course, the combination system is, is ancient of days. And so now with the advent of solid state, he would have used those. We were confident about that. And so all of that has been added to uh, the work of this particular organ. So we're gonna leave the blower room now and avoid touching all these electrical things. Um, and we're gonna turn the blowers on and then we'll talk about other things. Let's walk behind the organ. So you can see back here, there's another gigantic steel iron apparatus that goes from the floor to the ceiling, enabling the workers to haul lots of materials into the attic, during which was necessary for the uh, 2006 building renovation. Um, the organ has two wooden ladders attached to it, and we're going to go up those in just a second. But on the, the back of the case, you can see what looks like rather fresh plywood. And this was uh, added in the, the work that Taylor and Booty did to the organ to strengthen the case. We realized that the case was somewhat flimsy in that it had quarter inch plywood you know, as its primary um, covering. And so uh, that wood that was you know, originally on the organ is still there, but it would sort of sympathetically vibrate with the, uh, uh, the 
pedal playing, pedal notes, low notes, for instance. Here you can see, I think up close perhaps, the fact that there's a another inch worth of wood that has been added to the case just to strengthen it. And what that's done is make everything more reflective. So here's the back of positive division. Um, that one's opened. We'll look in there later. Let's let's fire up this baby. All right. So the blowers are now on. You hear them click in the in the loft and. Uh, supplying the wind. So I've taken off the music rack so that we can see some of the mechanism. This is a tracker action organ. Um, of course, all of the stop knobs and combination system is all electric, so um, nothing mechanical about those. But just have a look here on our left are the pedal stops uh, from reeds at the top all the way down to the 32 foot principle on the base. Um, swell division is to its right. There are stop knobs, um, and there is the control for the solid state memory and combination system. Um, this mechanism here are all the components of the, the great keyboard, and um, next to that would be the positive stops, and followed by some couplers there. The great division, and finally the solo division, which is just above. You can practically reach up and touch them. So here, you know, if you're accustomed to working on an organ that has electric action, you don't have many moving parts like this. But for instance, uh, the great division, um, you know, right in front of us here, you can see the, the trackers moving, I, I hope, um, as I rumble through here. And so with a sound on, here's what you're getting. So in, within each of these, there are several leather nuts, both at the top here and below that enable you to tighten or loosen uh, the connections here so that particularly if you're dealing with, you know, quick temperature changes or humidity um, extremes, then, uh, you know, basically you can make the adjustment here. And so sometimes you might get a cipher uh, because they've tightened up, say, in the heat and humidity, in which case then you just have to identify the correct one and then adjust these leather nuts. Very simple. Um, it's, it's sort of... Uh, you know, idiotic in a way that you can just easily get in there and do these things. But you can see here with the, the tracker action, here's the top keyboard, the solo. And I don't know if you can see, but basically the key um, is, is about uh, two feet long. And so at the end of the second, <laughs> of the end of this, you basically have, um, you know, the, the change of direction. So there's a link there where you're pushing up a, a metal piece that connects to a roller board, which, you know, again, moves the, uh, the direction of the force. And so, you know, it's rather basic and it all links together through a variety of means. When we look at the other side of this, it may make more sense to you, but, you know, here's probably the best view of, of this. So on the Great Division, as I was pointing out earlier, like that, you can see these, these black pieces here, and that's actually carbon fiber. Um, this was, was uh, substituted in here originally in these positions were piano wire basically that ran from, from right where we're looking all the way up to the Great Division which is another, oh, I don't know, 40 or so feet away. And the piano wire was a little bit spongy, I must say, uh, and so while I think many builders have discovered the, the, the benefits of um, carbon fiber, uh, they certainly, you know, were happy with it, with Taylor and Booty. So, let's go inside and see what's happening. There are many ways to get into this organ, and so we're going to take the first closest spot, uh, which is just behind the key desk, and here we will get some lights on, and now we're looking inside to the point where uh, we're at the other side of the console. Um, and those uh, keys that I was just playing on the solo uh, basically are now above us. So the above my head is the solo division, and here is uh, a series of mechanisms, the squares that, you know, change the direction of the force, connecting to trackers that come along here to uh, 
the squares that actually pull the pallet down right here, which is in the chest, which is just two inches away, uh, just above like that. And here again, you see leather nuts on both the top and bottom of the square. See these connectors here, connections here into the roller board, all of which you know are, are points of adjustment if needed. Uh, here is basically the coupling mechanism. So when you draw a stop uh, coupler, um, you hear the clunk. And it used to be a pneumatic device that forced these things into position. Now there are solenoid motors here, um, here, and here that push these things into place. So basically you draw the, the coupler and, and you get this sort of movement which locks these other components into place so that when you want to couple, say, great and swell, or you know, post even swell, or pedal to great, etc. There's a, a, a lot of stuff that gets moved here at the same time. Um, the carbon fibers that you saw connecting to the great division, um, it's similar with the swell. The swell division comes down and runs below this this uh, piece of plywood, which simply lifts off. This is here to protect uh, the trackers that are beneath it and they connect to these various squares here, the whole row of wooden squares. Um, originally, this organ had squares that were made of a, a plastic material, but they found that the, at the point here at the hinge, they had seized up. And so, Cho and Booty replaced them with wood ones. And here again are carbon fibers that are uh, destined to the swell division, which again is probably 30 feet away. Um, and again, all of this is adjustable through the leather nuts. Um, uh, and then back here, there's a whole scary thing that looks like a lot of electrical components um, and card readers that have all to do with um, the control of the uh, stop motors that, um, that we'll see once we get up above. So before we leave here, um, you can see down here some of the pedal mechanism that, well, it's rather dark and I'm in the way, uh, but the pedal is, of course, you know, split uh, to one to the left side and to the right, and so there's mechanisms that keep that going where it needs to go. Right in front of us are the other sides of the stop knobs, and so um, this would be all the, the controllers for um, the positive division. Um, meticulous wiring and bundling, I think. Uh, you know, this is the work of a, a seriously OCD human being um, to, to wrap this so carefully and, and beautifully. Um, exactly the sort of person you need doing this type of work. But these uh, stop knobs uh, controls are um, the British um, ha uh, Harris draw knobs, I believe. Um, and so uh, basically the original knobs to the organ, um, you know, connect to the other side of that. They're simply screwed on like, uh, like you'd expect. Okay, so let us go uh, up to the solo division and have a quick look here. I pointed out to you um, the pneumatic slider motors um, that were original to the organ. Um, these items here with the green covers are uh, the new items that replaced the originals. And these are solid state um, machines that, you know, when you draw the, the stop, let's see, in this case it's the Voxumana 8, it simply moves the slider in and out like so. Um, in the old days, this would be done by those big pneumatic uh, boxes that we saw back in the blower room. Um, and sometimes they would work, and sometimes they would not. The fact that they were, uh, you know, vacuum controlled meant that the, the low wind pressure going through them, um, if there were any leaks whatsoever, there wouldn't be enough strength to get the slider into position. Um, but these are uh, located throughout the organ. There are five here on this side, and then at the other end of the solo division, you would see the uh, remainder. But in this case, so much of of uh, the organ is laid out in such a way that it just makes perfect sense. So here we have the four-foot musette right in the front part of the chest, uh, followed by behind that are the, is the Vox Humana, half length, um, actually quarter length. Um, so they're, they're rather uh, um, stubborn to tune, let's say, and uh, the weather does have a grand effect on them. And now at the other end of the solo are the remainder of the stop motors. As we go up and look forward to the cathedral, um, whether or not you can see them, I don't know, I can't reach them, but here is an array of 
uh, carbon fibers, and we saw them earlier because those are the carbon fibers which continue straight up to the Great Division. Um, and so behind those are the facade pipes of the solar division, and that's a four-foot four foot principle. Um, above us, then, would be the swell chest. So the swell division is up above us, and therefore we're looking at the bottom of the swell chest. And here is the roller board, which distributes the, uh, the, the keyboard, you know, to spread out the action all the way to, um, you know, the very, very broad, uh, wide swell division, which we'll see in a moment. Um, right here is uh, one of the tremulants for the swell division. So, you know, when you pull that tremulant, it, it, it basically moves this up and down and shakes the wind. There are two of them because there's a C side and a C natural side. So you have to look carefully for both of them. And right above us is sort of a coupling mechanism that engages the eight, eight and four foot shamar uh, reed. So we're going to leave the solo and bring this tour uh, elsewhere. Um, the next stop will be the, us climbing up to uh, the ladder in the back and getting us to the swell division. So uh, here we are going up the back of the organ. And while we're here, we could talk just a little bit about the, uh, the beautiful, magnificent stained glass window that hides behind the organ. Um, source of some consternation, but actually this is one of the, the, the windows by uh, Willett, uh, the local uh, window man. And as you can see, I mean, this, this uh, depicted in this window are scenes of praise. So we've got you know, wind players, we've got string players, we've got harpists, we have organ pipes, uh, we have singers. Um, we'll see a few more when we get up to the next level. Um, so in any case, uh, before we go into the swell, you'll notice that there are several boxes on the back. These are power suppliers that actually uh, control the, uh, the stop motors. Uh, there's one for each division, in some case, cases, a uh, power supply for, um, you know, two for, per division. So here we are in the swell division, all right? And dead ahead of us, you can see the swell box as we look to the front of the cathedral, those big panels that are kind of a, a bear to work because uh, the mechanism that controls them is mechanical. So you're pushing a lot of, a lot of weight when you open and close the swell box, uh, as opposed to one that's got a motorized control. So notice how shallow the, the case is. So from front to back, it's almost, it's, it's less, it's probably four and a half to five feet deep um, with the, you know, wooden case being a heavy mass. It reflects the sound right into the room because the, the organ sits in the room. So the sound travels gently in this, this beautiful acoustic. Um, above here, straight in front of us is part of the five rank cornet, which is mounted and and raised up above the other pipes, you can see that the cornet is, uh, there are tubes that come from the chest below that provide the wind just for the cornet. There's another set to our left. But first, and you'll notice that, again, the, the reeds are right to the back of the chest so that the uh, four foot, eight foot, and 16 foot reeds are very accessible when it comes time to tuning. Um, the organ has been very stable, except when the temperature radically changes, particularly when the air conditioning comes on that causes the most of the havoc. Um, above us, we see yet another roller board way up there, a rather large one that provides for the mechanism that plays the great division. So above us is the great, uh, and we'll be up there in just a moment. So here's the other portion of the cornet uh, stop, and we need a key to get out of here, and that will get us to um, the next level. And, and brings us to another stairwell, again on the back of the organ. And again, noticing the magnificent window here. Um, So here we are getting to the top, and you can see even more depictions of, of faithful people praying and singing and singing out of hymn books and uh, all sorts of things. Um, 
no doubt a stunning Gregorian chant or perhaps something more modern with guitar, I don't know. So here we are at the top. Um, here's another power supply which will provide uh, power to the great solenoids. And uh, also here there are a couple of lighting units which are mounted on the back of the organ case which illuminate the, uh, the stained glass window which we, which we see. And I'm trying to get into the grate now. These, the German locks are double locks, um, which make them a bit of a challenge to get in and out of. Um, here we are inside the grate, just like the swell, it's very narrow, very shallow in depth. So from, from where I'm standing to the facade pipes in front um, is, is maybe four and a half feet. So the, the uh, shallow casework is really critical, I think, to this. Um, like the swell, I mean, all these full, full length uh, ranks of pipes are, are perfectly stored and stacked. Uh, we've got here the four foot uh, trumpet, eight foot trumpet, and then 16 foot trumpet. And they're arranged pretty much in major thirds on these chests, but it's not always consistent. So um, looking to the front, perhaps you can see through the facade pipes to, uh, to the nave below. Uh, we're pretty high right now, um, but at least at this point, we're still inside the case. So let's go over here and have a look at the pedal division um, from up above. Um, so there's not much to hold on to here. And some of these boards say, do not step here. Um, but in any case, what we're looking at is the 32 foot Pozon, which extends from the floor miles below us right out the, the top of the case and you might be able to see that they've covered that one with some mesh uh, so that nothing crawls in there or flies in there and dies uh, i think there may be something dead in the low d but we haven't figured that out yet in order to get to it we have to remove a lot of pipe work so that's a project coming up soon but as you can see the 32 foot poson is basically uh, laid into this casework in segments with several uh, rack boards to keep it in place they are heavy um, and so below as you can see some of the reeds and that's quite a ways down uh, and then on the back wall are several of the board and ranks um, that you know just rumble away back here um, so we'll have a look at the at the pedal uh, once we get back down below. <clears throat> if I can close this up, that would be good. And we're going to go back downstairs now. Uh, I feel like Mr. Green Jeans with all these keys. Okay, so back down the main staircase will get us into the swell and we'll have to cut through the swell to get to the other ladder which will get us downstairs and so go through the swell division once again straight away before we exit the case we're going to go into one of the pedal sections here if i can squeeze through without damaging anything we are now um at that point in the pedal division where we were looking at a moment ago from above uh, but in this case this is where we can tune the reeds for instance uh, everything is rather neatly placed right right down below us here so we're in the c natural side um, and so you can see that uh, the four foot trumpet Here's the slider control for that, the solenoid that moves the slider in and out. Um, and so they are neatly arranged here, easy access for tuning. And then the 16 foot fagot is on this side. The bigger reeds are in the front of the chest, which is here. So we're looking at trumpet eight, poson 16, and poson 32. And then there's the mixture and octave and uh, what else, uh, contrabass. Um, so, uh, this is the layout, and again, rather narrow, but all accessible, and um, very much um, user-friendly, if the user is not too big. Finally, I want to go down and show you the base of the pedal division, like below where we were just. There's more, but you can't go anywhere without locking 
the doors. Back down the last staircase. And let's have a look inside this part of the pedal division. Here is another reservoir that uh, serves the C-sharp side. You can see here the curtain valve mechanism that controls the flow of air. Uh, some of you, if you were here for Craig Kramer's concert last year, one of these strings broke at the very end of the Pasacalia and Fugue in C minor. It was sort of a devastating thing for the performer, I suspect, but Craig is a, a professional and just took it in stride and managed to play with half of the organ dead. <laughs> so, but we were able to attach a, a string. Ken and I uh, got here and you know put it back together so within 10 minutes or so we were up and running. But here's an example of that uh, pedal, you know, mechanical action system here the great or the, the pedal division actually has three different chests there are uh you know they from the front to the back and so here uh the pedal trackers from the console have to be divided into three separate locations one right in front of me one right here and then another back there and so you know one one of those chests is for just uh, you know the reeds that are in the back of the chest um, the one in the middle is for the front part of the chest, and this that you're looking at is mostly you know, for the resultant and 32-foot principle. But these are, of course, subject to humidity and, and, uh, and moisture and all of that. And so it's possible that at times you might have to you know, find these leather nuts to tighten or loosen the connection so that uh, you know, it, it basically would control whether or not you have you know, any ciphers. Same thing here. I mean, on this side, you can see all the connections up there. Um, at least everything is, is accessible and easy to get to, uh, so that when you do have a, a mechanical challenge, it's easy to get to. So finally then, a quick look at the positive division. Uh, when we come to the positive, uh, we can turn on a light here and look inside. Um, and here, again, like the other uh, divisions, we've got right in front of us the um, eight-foot crumb horn right here, and then behind that the 16-foot uh, barf fife. Um, I'm told that, that when uh, Paul Coco was working with Beckerot on, on this installation, um, they, would, they requested from him all German nomenclature. Uh, and so the 16-foot barf fife certainly fits right in with the, with the Germanic background, but I don't know if it's possible to even see this, but right here on the 16-foot barf fife, uh, the lowest note, it says English horn. Um, it is stamped into the metal, so I think, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's still an English horn. Um, and down here, finally, you'll see all of the new solenoid motors that were replacements of the original uh, pneumatic driven devices. Um, and so of course the mechanism for the positive then runs uh, from here is straight under the floor to a roller board that sits under this panel and then goes directly to the console and connects. Okay, I'm gonna pause for just a moment and put the music rack back together and then play a book studio to piece.
as we come into the narthex of the church, um, I'll point out a few things to you. Uh, the church was designed to uh, have somewhat of a, a reminiscent of in the hull of an inverted ship. And if you look up at the ceiling, uh, you can see it certainly looks like that. The idea behind that is that the church is our vessel to heaven to eternity, and it's through the church, and as we approach the altar, that we make our way to eternal life. So starting in the back of the church here, we have above the entrance, the two captains of the ship, the Old Testament, uh, Noah, and the New Testament, uh, St. Peter, who were the captains of the ship, as, as we would call it. The interesting lights that you see hanging are lanterns with the Fresnel lenses that you see on a ship. There's all kinds of incredible detail here as we walk down the path of virtue, which has all sorts of interesting symbols in the floor. You'll notice that unlike most Catholic churches, there are no votive candles and pretty much uh, no statues. Uh, Father Coakley really wanted this to be reminiscent of his idea of Catholic faith, which was more intellectual. And if you look at the uh, stone carvings above each arch, they're all um, Catholic intellectual people, scientists and uh, writers, whatnot. We have uh, Dante, we have Louis Pasteur, we have Mendel, Copernicus, um, and amongst all kinds of other interesting intellectual people. If you look up at each of the arches, all of the 12 apostles are carved into the uh, bases of the, of the trusses. Uh, we have 14 here. So we have the 12 apostles plus St. Paul here and Matthias. So if we have the original 12, we also have Judas Iscariot who betrayed Christ. And if you look at his interesting carving, he's clutching his money bag and covering his head in shame while an angel weeps above him. Just, just incredible detail. And as we go up to the altar, there are two chapels on both sides the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, which was completed around 1939 and has some incredible murals painted by a well-known artist by the name of Jan DeRozan. And as we come in here and come up, you can see these incredible murals. The tabernacle here and the candlesticks were crafted in France and escaped Nazi Germany. They were hidden for quite a while. And when they finally came to America, they were on display for one year at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Coming back around, we can head over to the Lady Chapel which is on Shady Avenue. And the Lady Chapel was completed in 1954. Just an incredible, 
incredible place. As we come up into the sanctuary area, we have the choir stalls and organ, and just some more incredible detail. This beautiful map of the world with the inscription saying that in every place there is a sacrifice and there is offered to my name in a clean oblation. There's all sorts of interesting detail carved into these panels, including this interesting little uh, scene, which at the very top is uh, Father Coakley, the priest that's uh, sitting at the very top, praying his, his bravery in his library. And then down here, this really interesting scene of two priests being cast into hell uh, with the devil poking them in organ pipes in the uh, background. And there's an interesting story here, but uh, Father Coakley had a professional musician hired and sang the Gregorian propers every single Sunday, which are extremely difficult. Most parishes could not do that. Most parishes were doing uh, plain chant and were doing simple, um, simple settings of the propers in Latin that were, uh, were available. Most commonly in this diocese were the settings that were written by Father Carlo Rossini, who was organist to St. Paul's Cathedral at the time. And uh, his simple settings were meant to be done in most parishes. And Father Rossini and his sidekick, uh, Father Sanderbeck, um, really had it out with uh, Father Coakley and said those, those uh, Gregorian chants that you're doing are too difficult. You should be doing simple, uh, chants um, like the ones that I wrote and Father Coakley said no we're going to do the proper Gregorian chants and between all this bickering uh, Father Coakley <laughs> depicted that <laughs> great scene with uh, Rossini and uh, Father Sanderbeck being uh, tormented by the devil in heaven or in hell <laughs> and <laughs> incidentally the uh, pipes they're showing 10 more 10 organ pipes. The original uh, organ here was intended to be 10 ranks larger than the organ at the cathedral. And the, the uh, nave of the church um, aisle is actually 10 feet longer than the cathedral um, in Oakland. So as we look at over at the organ here, we have um, or organ, which the basis of is a 1933 E.M. Skinner organ. It was intended to be uh, 90 ranks when completed, but unfortunately, because the church had not been complete yet, and because there wasn't um, enough money, only a third of the organ was put in at the time with the intention of adding the other ranks as the church had the money and as the church was completed. Over the years, the organ's been greatly altered. Um, it's now approximately 50 ranks, and a new replacement console from a 1950s vintage Aeolian Skinner was added a few years ago. Unfortunately, the original console, which was carved to match the choir stalls with this beautiful um, uh, book panel, um, was destroyed and is long gone, unfortunately. Um, I'm hoping that in the not too distant future, we may be able to raise the money and have the organ completed and restored to the way that it was originally intended in the 1933 contract. Another interesting thing that I think you'd enjoy seeing is this interesting staircase, which goes up to one of the organ chambers and I'll take you up inside. And we go up about 25 steps. And it 
takes us into this room in the organ chamber where you can see uh, the grate and the uh, swell. And you can look down through these thin curtains and see the sanctuary below. It's also interesting to notice that the windows above the organ area are interesting. All Catholic composers at the very top. Um, it's probably too small for you to see, but we have Palestrina, we have Vittoria, we have Cesar Franck. Um, it's really interesting, and you probably wouldn't notice that. And back inside the staircase, if you climb up, up, and up, um, 143 steps, it takes you to the tower, uh, bell tower, where we have three beautiful bells that were cast in Croydon, uh, South London, by the Gillette and Johnston uh, Bell Foundry, and they were installed in 1954. Um, we're in the process of getting them restored. I'm hoping that we'll have them restored by Easter time. There are three bells. Um, the largest one, if you could find a foundry today that could cast it, uh, would be over $100,000 just for that one bell. Uh, which is christened Thomas uh, in memory of Father Thomas Coakley. The other two bells, Walter and Raphael, are um, smaller. Uh, Thomas, the largest bell, is an A, uh, uh, plays the, uh, the note A. Uh, Walter is uh, used for uh, funeral uh, tolls, and that uh, sounds the pitch of D major. And um, uh, Raphael, the other uh, bell, uh, plays an F sharp. So when they ring together, it's a lovely D major chord. Um, I'm a little winded. I said I wasn't gonna do this, but you never get to see this. So I climbed up to the top of the tower here. And I'll let you see the inside of the bell tower here with our three bells. As I said, Thomas here is the largest behind me. And then we have Walter here. And Raphael here. Um, looking out, you can see all over the city. Say hello to Alan Lewis and John Tillian across the street at uh, Calvary. And then you can say hello to Ed Moore <laughs> over at East Liberty Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, so um, like I said, I'm hoping uh, to, that we'll have all the funds together and we'll be able to have these restored and ringing by, by Easter. Thanks so much. I thought you might also like to see the blower room that sends the air to the major part of the organ. There's a separate uh, blower in the basement of the front of the church for the antiphonal division. But here... To conclude our tour today, I'd like to give you two little snippets so you can hear a little bit of the organ. Um, the first is part of a meditation by Floor Paters, 
Uh, the second one is part of a trumpet voluntary by David Lasky. that you enjoyed this evening's program. It was fascinating to be able to see behind the scenes of two of Pittsburgh's most iconic instruments. This is something we typically couldn't do when we're gathered together in person. Our sincerest thanks goes out to Ken Danchik, our subdean, as well as to John Tillian, our technology coordinator, for all of their efforts in executing this evening's event. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Don Fellows, the director of music at St. Paul Cathedral Parish, as well as to J.R. Daniels, the Director of Music at what's now called St. Jude Parish, encompassing Sacred Heart Church and St. Raphael Church. Gentlemen, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your willingness to participate and for opening your doors to us virtually this evening. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night.